This is a conversation I had with Lorna Byrne as part of a day entitled Dante and Other World Journeys, organised by the Scientific and Medical Network. I've been reading and following Lorna over a number of years and have spoken with her before. I think she is in the tradition of genuine seers and visionaries, which would include figures like Julian of Norwich, Hildegard of Bingen and the Beguines. And on this occasion, I took the chance to put to her in particular some of the insights that Dante and also William Blake had, not just about the angels that she's so well known for seeing, but also in terms of her more visionary perception of reality, trying to wrestle with what she says whilst being open with what she says in the hope that by bringing these other voices into the conversation, something of what she sees might open up. William Blake remarked that in an age which he called Ulro, one in which so many relationships are mediated by technology and science alone, it is hugely valuable to cultivate the perceptions of reality that are known to be living known to be organic, mediated by friendship and love, and even more so to be able to situate that within a perception of eternity, so providing the space that the human soul needs to flourish, as well as the support that the human body needs to survive. I try to listen to what Lorna says, wrestle with it, feel myself being changed by it as I bring what I have learnt, my own perceptions from other parts of life, in order that a new experience, understanding, feeling, even awareness of things might become that little bit more established. It's using the old understanding of scepticism, in fact, which isn't about debunking other people's convictions, but is first and foremost holding lightly to your own sense of things, not abandoning your discernment, quite the opposite, bringing your discernment, but letting in what others say in order that the primary focus of change might be yourself. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and inquiry. And I begin by asking Lorna to reflect on the great transition from her earliest days seeing spirits, angels and into other worlds, becoming hugely well known for that now, but also how suffering, her own suffering and others' suffering, has always been part of that. that that's an absolutely lovely question. It is incredible to me. But, but to me, lots of people would say, you know, you were very poor, you, you lived a really hard life and you suffered. But I don't look on it that way. I, I wouldn't be who I am today, only for I have lived that life. You know, and I know I'm dyslexic, so I, I was considered, you know, retarded, you know, in that, in that way. And I've had the best teachers in the world, and, and that has been the angels and God. They have taught me everything I know, and they have taught me how to, how to see as well. Like, you know, and to me, that, that is incredible, because as I was a child, I thought everyone else could. I never understood um, why my mom or dad or my brothers or sisters or my neighbours couldn't. And they just always said to me, kind of kept reminding me constant, constantly to keep it a secret. And, and now I know why they said keep it a secret, you know, because if I hadn't, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I probably would have ended up in an institution. And um, so I'm glad the angels kind of pestered me in that way, don't say anything, because that, that was really important. But they used to say to me, you know, that one day I would write about God and us. Now that didn't mean me in that, that sense. And 
you know, I just always thought that was impossible because I couldn't read or write. I spent my whole life learning how to write my name. And even today, I can't talk and write my name at the same time. Because if not, I can't, I can't do it. You know, so... And, and then when the miracles started to happen, when I eventually said yes, and it took a long time to say, to say yes, um, the first book came out, Angels in My Hair, and that took four years to do. Um, and I have to say thank you to Mark Bruce, my editor. He's, he's just brilliant. So there's already a huge amount in what Lorna just explained. The best teachers in the world taught her to see and I wanted to focus on that issue of perception because I think what she's saying is by her dyslexia, by her lack of education, by the poverty of her background, she stayed open. We know that children introject and introject in particularly undefended ways. They're very vulnerable to the environment, but also able to take in more of the environment when perhaps as adults that closes down. And I think that that is partly what she's saying, that these early perceptions stayed with her. She kept them secret to protect them so that they weren't eroded by impingements from the world and so were able to develop. So do you think it's fair to say then that the years prior to you starting to talk and then work with people like Mark Booth were a kind of, preparation so that you could speak about what you see what you know um to a wider audience yes i i believe all that happened for in one sense unknown reasons to me at the time um, and i'm still amazed the way you know tv shows you know have me on radio shows all around the world even news stations some countries i will go to i'm I'm on their news that day, like, you know, it just, it just seems kind of incredible, but I'm just sharing with the world, I'm the messenger, I'm sharing everything I know, and everything I understand, and I, I can't agree with someone if, if I have been shown different, you know, I, I, I'll say I, you know, that's not what I have been shown. I have to be very honest. And I, I think being honest is a very important part of it and keeping your, your eyes open, your mind open and allowing your soul to come forward. And I guess that's what Dante did his best to do at times. You know? yeah. No, he very much said, um, he dresses you know, us now and says, look, you may not believe what I'm going to say, and I don't fully understand it myself, and yet I, I've been told by God and the angels, he will even say that, to communicate this to you, and maybe I don't know quite where it's going to end up, and yet somehow it's important to do so, to follow that truth by remaining truthful to it yourself insofar as you can. And just to add a further thought about the business of speaking her truth, even if it disagrees with what others say. I think this is not about having an argument. It's much more the prophetic voice that is faithful to what it sees and offers that for others then to discern and make something of. It's an open system view of reality rather than a closed system view, which is how modern reason tends to work. It tends to look for internal consistency, internal coherence, and use that as the measure of certainty. Whereas Lorna is in the tradition, say, of Socrates, whose demon, which in those days didn't mean the bad guy, but I think meant pretty much the same as what we would call angel now, whose demon would say things to him that he knew clearly he couldn't immediately make sense of, but brought them into the world in order that time could tell the meaning and significance of it. Yeah, I, I do believe you have to you have to give the truthful message, just like Dante did. He did his utmost best and you know, 
the world can influence us in so many different ways as well. And it's to try and push that aside. But I, I would say for him, it was really hard because he was living in a time where life was really so different to what life is today. I'd imagine if I was born then and even opened my mouth and said anything, I probably would have been burnt as a stake, at the stake or something like that or being accused of being a witch or, you know, something evil in that, in that way. And Dante managed to, to write what he did. And I, I know it's kind of, what would you say, you know, the torment within his mind, you know, and, and what he was seeing and him actually having the courage to, to write it down no matter how many times he was rejected or laughed at or anything like that. Yeah, I was very struck when I was getting to know your work as well, how you were often asked by people who were suffering about their suffering. And whilst you were always kind, you never flinched from saying to people, there might be some significance in this and inviting people to draw on strength and courage to stay with it. And that get carries the ring of authenticity to me. It was one of the things that I noticed. Does that make sense? It, it does, because, you know, when I, I'd hate in one sense to say that we have to suffer, but it is the human body that is suffering or a human mind in that way. But it helps us to look deeper onto the spiritual side of ourselves. It helps us to, to connect to our soul. Um, and I know the human body, you know, gets sick, you know, falls asunder, does all kinds of things. But the soul, the spiritual part of you doesn't. It's perfect. It's unique. It's, it's pure love. You cannot damage it in any way. So this is this really hard issue of the meaning of suffering, but how it's transformed by this eternal perspective so someone like Julian of Norwich can say, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Not because she's sidelined or circumvented the suffering, but because she's been through the middle of it. It's the embrace of tragedy that becomes the comedy, which Dante understood. Dante, the pilgrimage he journeys through, particularly paradise, is repeatedly shocked by the people he meets, who he knew to have suffered in life, saying they understood this now, that it was all part of their realisation of their return to the divine. And William Blake says it too. He has Albion at the end of his great poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, throw himself into the furnaces of affliction and see them transformed into fountains of living water. And just to conclude the sort of almost introductory comments to you and your work um, before moving more onto direct parallels with Dante and Blake, which I so want to put to you. Um, but, you know, now, 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 you know, your work is very much with people who are suffering through the books, which have been so successful, but through very extensive children's work now, through peace work even, and then the latest project, building a place of sanctuary and um, where you live as well. So it's really becoming quite something. Yes, and, and the sanctuary is a complete miracle. I, I knew about it as a child, but never quite understood it. And it's, it's like when you allow yourself to be open spiritually, how would I say things come, you know, those miracles happen and, and those miracles started to happen as soon as I said yes, you know, those, those words I, I uttered, even though I was terrified, in one sense as well. You know, and the, the sanctuary is, you know, to have no boundaries and to help people of all faiths and none and, and to teach as well, you know, how to see, how to be open, the way God and the angels taught me. Now, I want to pick up, sorry, yeah, because, because if, if I can see energy as clearly as I see you sitting there on the screen, I can see your guardian angel, I can see a billion more things that I don't even talk about. And 
I don't see any reason why you can't. I'm going to definitely pick, pick up that can. with you. Yeah, I want to ask you about that for sure. But look, let me just ask a little detail, because this is what, one of the things which is so um, lovely about reading you. When you say things like, I knew as a child about the sanctuary, but didn't know what it mean. What, what did you see as a child? And then when you could compare that with what you know now, how is that comparison? Um, well, that's really hard to, 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 to explain that. It's like, you know, one time God held my hand and he brought, and I was only a child and, and he brought me through this building and had me look out the windows and told me about it. You know, and I didn't understand whatsoever. And then at different times of my life, I was reminded of it. Um, but I never thought about it, to be honest. You know, um, if something is going to unfold and God wants it, then I just let it unfold. I don't go searching for it. I don't go looking for it. And it just happened. It's a complete miracle as well, just like so many other things. So just also to add that when Lorna says miracle, I don't think she means God intervening. I think she means collaborating with the divine that is always at work and is as much this art of getting out of the way as participating. You might say in very highbrow terms that she is conscious of what Aristotle would call the final cause, the biggest picture tendency that is unfolding. And she doesn't get preoccupied with what Aristotle would call the efficient or material cause, which is the immediate thing that's going on that makes something happen in the very tangible sense. She's able to stay focused on that wider horizon, not worry about trying to understand it ahead of time. And then another way of putting this was that she is able to act, but without attachment, to be able to be in the world, but without worrying about the results of her being in the world. This very widespread teaching in spiritual wisdom traditions that enable us to be fully engaged with now, but also to be able to be engaged with the next now and then the next now and the next now because we're responding to this much wider sense of life that we're part of rather than trying to be in control or to possess life and steer it as if we're the only actors involved. No, I think Lorne is very clear that there's all sorts of other agencies around and about that we can become participants with and collaborators with, co-workers with. Um, so it's not being completely passive. It is kind of being open and collaborating with what you see as well. Yeah, I, 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 I can't change who I am. I can't be every, everyone else. I'm, I'm just me. I never strive to be anyone else or to be successful like others in the world. I, I just trust God and go down the path. If, if, if God and the angels showed me something fantastic in front of me, you know, and I'm walking in that direction, and God suddenly says, now you're to go left, it doesn't bother me what was in front of me. I just go left. Now, look, this, I, is, I one of those, this <laughs> is one of those moments where I get slightly um, shivers in my spine because... Another reason why I was so fascinated with your work was because some of the people from history that I most greatly respect were guided by what we would now call angels, I think. And one of them, in fact, was Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher. And he actually says, or Plato tells us, that on one occasion, his demon, as he called his angel, because demon didn't have the negative associations in ancient Greece, but his demon did say, go left. And so he went left. See, you're, you're, you're meant to go, go left, not, not straight on, even though you may have seen something incredible and, and you could be humanly saying to yourself. Um, and I suppose I don't talk to myself humanly. I only, in a sense, connect to the spiritual part of myself, my soul. So I would never cross my mind humanly to say oh no I want that what's in front of me that looks fantastic I'm I'm ignoring you 
and go straight on because it would never work out. And so another interesting comparison for me is that it seems that sometimes what is spoken to you, what you hear and see is quite trivial. And it seems, you know, what's the significance of this? Sometimes it's much more immediately meaningful, say, when an angel speaks to you about someone who's come to see you. And then at other times it's very visionary. You know, like you were saying, you were guided by God through a house and so on. It seems almost coming from a different time and place. These different levels of perception as well. Is that, that that's a good way of characterizing it, is it? I, I think, yes, that's a good good way of char- characterizing it. And, and I know Dante and, and many others, you know, that's the way it was in that sense. You know, you do have to self- separate yourself humanly from your spiritual part of you. And I suppose mankind was still fighting with the supernatural in that sense, because that's what your soul is. We're kind of put all our thoughts, um, you know, on a human level, but it's like you need to step over that human level. At the moment, I'm I'm working with someone on, on another book, John, and he's a scientist. And I love him talking with me and asking the questions. It's kind of mind blowing, you know, it's incredible. And he's finding it mind blowing because of the answers he's been given back, you know. Um, so I'm enjoying talking with yourself. Okay, well, let, let's move yeah. into something maybe that links the, the scientific and, and, and the, the spiritual, the supernatural. Um, I mean, one, one thing that's very evident in your writing and in lots of figures like Dante is about the role of light that you might say that the light which we think we see with our eyes is actually just a reflection of divine light or the true light and Blake puts this you know when he sees the sun he says I don't just see a disc rising in the sky I see the angels crying holy 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 um that 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 chimes with your experience does it Um, yes light is such a proper I say light is so fascinating I I think we have to and science has to learn so much more about light you know light penetrates everything it goes through everything even that darkness that we say is there I have to smile as light it is light it's it's not darkness as as we understand in that in that way either you know um the light of the angels, even the light of your soul, the light of, of the energy or the aura, whatever science call it, around your body and within your body. I think what Lorna's talking about here is actually the same as the first lesson that Dante has to learn when he arrives in paradise. And Beatrice explains to him that darkness isn't a thing in itself. It's just a different quality or kind of light and that he needs to be able to tune into the light wherever it's found and follow its qualities rather than worry about its quantity. Um, Owen Barfield said the same thing when he discovered the power of poetry. The trick is not to try to collapse the poetry into its meaning, but to stay attuned to its energy and let the light of the words guide your soul into the meaning that might then further disclose itself to you. But I think Dante was, you know, was connecting to that light. He allowed the light of his soul to step forward. So it opened his mind in the sense of he wasn't just seen through his human eyes, but he was seen in the, we say it in a human way, through, through the eyes of his soul, through, through the eyes of that light. And that light reveals it's like um, it's like even when when he speaks of the sun and, and, and the angels, you know, the angels are all the ta- all the time traveling through space, but they're traveling through it on light as well. There's so many patterns there, and they crisscross and yet they don't touch. It's like um, every particle within light never touches either. And throwing in at this point a few lines from William Blake's poem, Jerusalem, by way of comparison, when he talks about the angels creating space and time, saying, 
They converse together in visionary forms dramatic, which bright, redounded from their tongues in thunderous majesty, in visions, in new expanses, creating exemplars of memory and of intellect, creating space, creating time, according to the wonders divine of human imagination. I mean, sometimes I wonder whether something I might half feel you see quite clearly. Yeah, I, I think in, in a sense, I sometimes it's hard for me to, to explain, but it's, it's just to become conscious of your soul. I think, you know, for just generations, you know, the soul wasn't even spoken of. The only ones that could speak of the soul were, you know, bishops and priests and imams and, you know, um, religious leaders. Um, the ordinary person wasn't. So they weren't um, as conscious of their soul as maybe some people are now. But Dante was. He was very aware, like so many others. But in a sense, it's to become aware of it and allow yourself. And even you're looking at something or you're sitting there in silence, like we don't have time anymore for silence you know, and be aware of that light, that, that soul within you and it coming forward and you will actually feel it. Many you people know. are saying this now, actually, that we have different kinds of perception and we've got very used to the, you might say, the kind of grasping perception that wants to sort of pin things down. But there's a much more expansive, open perception that lets in. It seems to chime with what you're saying. Yes, we, we have to, in a sense, let, let in. And, and in, in one way, I just say, you know, everyone is looking for meaning. Stop looking for meaning in that way, because even in every question you ask, and it depends on the way you're asking it, there's a million answers. But each time it's, it's giving you more of an understanding of that answer. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's even a million questions, another million questions to, to that. But it is to let, sometimes I feel so privileged when I see someone's soul come a little bit forward. It's incredible to see, you know, and I think if people just become aware of it more, they can, in a sense, reach in to that part of spirituality and allow the intertwining with the, with the body. And I want everyone to see what I see. Readers of Ian McGilchrist may be detecting the quality of attention that he associates with the right hemisphere being alluded to here, that openness rather than focus. And what Keats referred to as a negative capability the ability to be in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Lorna calls this letting the soul come forward, and she says a little bit more about that now. The soul will give an image of the person, but even if the person is sick or anything like that, or, you know, in their 90s or anything, anything like that, the image of the person won't be sick, won't be old. It will be, it will be young. And it's, it's that light, it's a different light than even the light of the angels. It's a different light than the light of the sun, or it's a different light than all those rays of light that, that come in and leave the earth and go through the earth as well. It's, it's just um, how would you, you just go silent. It's, I, 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 I can't I can't describe it any more than that. It's it's just beautiful. So look, let me put something to you that Dante describes and and see whether it makes sense. He talks about how when he's traveling through the afterlife. He's still got somehow his physical body with him and he's, he's not quite sure how that's so, but he says that he has. And that one of the ways this shows up is that the souls he encounters and the angels and spirits, when light falls on them, they don't cast a shadow, whereas his physical body casts a shadow. 
And he talks about how because their subtler bodies, you might say, their truer bodies, their souls, are much more resonant with the sunlight, say, and the light of the divine. And so it's, there's a harmony rather than a block, which, of course, is what causes a shadow. Now, does that make any sense in your experience? It, it, it makes perfect sense. You know, the soul does not cast a shadow and neither do angels cast a shadow. And in, in a sense, even light itself, the purity of light doesn't cast a shadow either. It's just there. You know, um, and on many occasions, you know, an angel or God would just take my soul and my body would be left behind. But on other occasions, how would I say it's like my body goes as well. I feel just like he, he has said. I, I would feel every step I would take. I would feel anything I touched. Um, and that, again, is, is slightly different. It is in the sense of it's like the, the weight of your body, of the human body, the senses of your human body are going with your soul. And I, I think that happens as well so that you can bring back a deeper message. Why would that help the deeper message, do you think? I think that helps the deeper message in the sense that um, the soul and the human body, and that would be the consciousness of the human person as well, is being touched in, a, in an emotional way, in a loving, but in, in a very deep emotional way, so that they can, when they get back, they can do a better job of translating as much as possible of what they went through and what they saw and what happened. Do you know, there's, again, there's such powerful resonance with Dante because he talks about how his physical body is present as a weight and it enables him to talk about spiritual struggle as if it's fighting a kind of gravity. And, and learning, though, also about a kind of levity, which is a likeness. So it very much deepens the sense that we can have reading him of what might be going on in these struggles. Yeah, there would be a huge amount um, going on in those struggles for him. I, I understand that. And in a sense, I can see how hard he even found it to, to explain that or to give a, a touch on it in that, in that way. And, and that weight, in a sense, is the, how would I say it? It's like, you know, that weight of the human part of us, we all the time wanting meaning. What does it mean? What does it mean? And it may not mean anything just at the moment. It's just something being given, something you're being shown, something you're, you're to tell. And I can imagine Dante fighting as, as he said, with, with his demons in that, in that sense of trying to unravel what he could, but you're only allowed to unravel so much because each time someone like himself comes along in the world, it's to help us all to, for that part of evolution to come, that in, intertwining. Of, of the spiritual side and the human side. You know, I can't wait for that. I would love to be here when it happens, but, and, and it depends, again, as Dante would, would say, you know, on how fast we accept that we're not just human beings, we're spiritual beings and the supernatural is there. You know, we're, we're not alone. It's just yeah. like, yeah. Your loved ones are there with you too. Yeah, I mean, again, there's so many resonances what, what you say. So another way of understanding the journey in the Divine Comedy is that Dante's whole person must, as a whole, become more and more attuned to the Divine. And so through his guides, like Virgil and Beatrice, um, who in a way I think are like guardian angels, although I'd be interested what you think about that, um, but they're, they're people he knew in life rather than angels from heaven but nonetheless they kind of moderate what he can see what he's allowed to see in order that he can 
take it in fully and not be overwhelmed or not be undone by it. So there's this kind of process of tuning in that goes on. Yeah, I think it's a lot of process and tuning in. And, and I, I love, you know, when, when people are put into Dante's life or even into my life to help it to move forward, to help for that process to, to happen. Um, because I think that is very, very important. And it's, it's not about Dante. And it's not about me. It's about everyone else. You know, it's about everyone else taking that step that Dante took or that step that I took. You know, when when you have the possibility to do that. So I, I hope that has kind of answered some of that question. Yeah, so j- just to reflect back, so that's like saying by us listening into what Dante writes, what you say, we can get a feeling for what that might be for ourselves as well. Yes, and, and in a sense, you can let it happen for yourself. It's like when you're out and about or you're at home, you, you spiritually a thought is given to you and, and you remember and you say, okay, and you, you allow your soul to come forward. You allow yourself to see what you see. Like I've had many people at different times and I have pointed out something to them. And I said, can you see it? And some of them would say no. And then suddenly somebody would get a shock and say, oh, my God, yes, I do. But how is that there? You know, like I always remember one scientist saying to me that um, if any scientist says to you, you know, things, not everything is possible, always remember one. Eh? What way did he put it? Um, God, now I can't remember what it, well, the impossible is possible. You know, you have to look on. And I think spiritually people have to look on in that way that everything is possible. Regardless how, how downtrodden we are. We are because we are being downtrodden all the time by by faith, by religion. But God and the angels are real. Our universe is real. You know, there's so much going on around us. It's not just all about us in that sense. You know, and we can, what would I say, reach out to, to change our world, to make it a better world. So I think this is saying more now about the nature of transformation. It's realising what Plato meant, for example, by the notion of the ideas or forms. These weren't laws or structures written into the cosmos. They were living presences, dynamics, that then in Neoplatonism got taken up into the idea of hierarchies of angels, Hierarchies meaning that different levels of reality have different living forms. There might be our immediate thoughts that come into us, which can be understood as a living presence. Or there might be the feeling of a place, the thrones and principalities, as the angels were called, of place, of time. What Lorna is also saying is that this realisation is something that jumps into our mind to use Plato's illusion again, like a spark that starts a flame. It's not an information transfer, it's a transformation of perception that enables life to be experienced in a different way. But as we move on to now, that also provokes responses and might even be quite powerfully rejected. Like I have been told, Lorna, don't ever go there. You know, so maybe one day I will put it on a tape where I'm not meant to go because of the way the world is and just leave it. So do you mean areas where it could be dangerous for you to speak out or the response you might get? I I think it's not dangerous for me to speak out, but it is um, in, in one sense, let's say, that the authorities of the world wouldn't want everyone to know that's is, maybe that's the way I'm I, I can explain it I mean in, in the Catholic Church you're born and raised a Catholic there's often a tension between visionaries 
and between the yeah. authorities. Is that partly what you're alluding to there? Um, no, not not just to the Catholic Church, but to to all religions, but not just to reli- religions, but to those in power as well. That's if God ever gives me time to do all of that. I mean, you are involved in more political spheres now, aren't you, with peace work and so on. So I guess that you're alert to the impact of what you can say in a different way. Yeah, and, and you have to you have to be, you know, fair, I have to be very compassionate. That is one thing that God has has always taught me and and you know, never to never to judge you know, to have that understanding and to listen. It's not for my thoughts. It's to listen to whoever is talking to me or speaking to me or whoever is suffering or whoever is, in a sense, happy and joyful. Can I ask you about something very particular now, focusing on (laughs) a different aspect of this experience, which is telepathy and precognition? Because one of the things which strikes me again is resonant with, I think, how you've described it and how Dante does is that these communications aren't, as it were, one to one. They're because of a participation in divine reality. They're kind of triangulated sometimes, I think of it. It's not that, as it were, you read my mind, but because you're aware of how we both share in the divine mind we're able to become more transparent to each other. It's a very interesting dynamic to me. And again, have I put that right as you experience it? Um, Yes, because I I would say to you, um, I'm even listening now. So I'm I'm in communication in that way. And yet I'm talking with you as well. And, And sometimes I put it in the books and make it as simple as I can saying I could be in conversation, you know, three ways or five ways, but it could be a million ways as well, you know, and and in a sense it becomes one voice. So it's a kind of, it's an openness rather than a focus, you might say, but then you can turn your mind to tune into different perceptions. I, I love the way you say a focus. I don't focus. Um. And, and sometimes I, I don't understand when someone would say we have to focus or, or we have to be still and concentrate. I think it's much simpler than that because I don't focus. I don't have to um, concentrate. It's, it's happening all the time with you. You're just, the human part of you, I think, is just, you know, in a sense, you have been conditioned for generations and generations that this is the way you should think. It should be just your mind in that sense, your, your, your consciousness, instead of letting your consciousness and the consciousness in, in a sense of, of your soul you know, to burst forward for them to intertwine. Intertwining is such a a, a William Blake word. He talks a lot about co-mingling. I love his use of that word. And it feels a bit like, you know, my experience in psychotherapy, which is about trying to move to the edges, you might say, of your personal concerns in order to be receptive to wider concerns. Is that another way of putting it, do you think? I I suppose it's another way of of putting it, you know, in that in that way. But for me, it's not. Okay. But I I think for everyone out there, it's another way of putting it to help mankind to step forward, to come become a bit closer, to become more open. Do you think it's not so for you? Because in a way, you always were open and never learned to close up. I, I, I think so in the sense of, you know, I never became contaminated by the world because I was, and I am still, dyslexic, but severely. Um, so in a sense, the, the world couldn't convince me of human things. 
I, I couldn't read or write or, or anything like that. I know the internet now is great, but even today, people would say, oh, you should read this book. You can get it on voice. I don't, because again, that would allow myself humanly to become com contaminated. So I, I don't. That's very fascinating. It's about keeping the gift open, I guess. Um, but, you know, it also makes me think about how sometimes a sense of self can be useful because it protects us. I mean, and you know, sometimes visions of angels are terrifying, for example, and they can feel very overwhelming. So I wonder about that element as, uh, element too. Well, I, I, I think, yes, for, for, for people out there. But for myself, I'd have to say no, because I always say it's from the moment I open my eyes. I didn't know they were angels. I just thought they were part of my family. You know, even the soul of a loved one. You know, even my little brother, when I was playing with them, with the blocks in front of the fire, and, and he says to me, you know, he can sit with his back to the fire. Um, and I, of course, I was only two or two and a half, so I never put two and two together. And it was only when the blocks fell and our hands touched and it was like my hand went into his or his went into mine and it just sparkles everywhere and just felt so much love. And that's when the angel said as well, I must keep it a secret and that my little brother had died before I was born. I still today call him my little brother, but he was born before I was. This for, for people who haven't read Angel... Angels in My Hair is one of the stories that Lorna tells in that book. So you can read about these things in her book. And also to add an extra thought that I wonder whether what Lorna's describing here is a bit like what Dante realises as he rises through the higher heavens of paradise. In particular, that the more the souls become themselves, the more they speak as a unity. It's the theme of unity in the divine being an incredible diversity, not a conformity. And so, for example, in the heaven of Jupiter, he sees individual souls but can't tell whether they're saying I or we. That is the fulfilment of who they are, which is the fulfilment and return of their being in God's being. It's this non-dual vision that shapes both Blake and Dante that I think Lorna knows quite directly herself. You mentioned the sanctuary at the beginning and how it's about helping people to see as you see. Can you can you tell us more about that? I mean, I wonder, you talk, for example, about learning to resonate with nature um, as well as with perception and so on, being taught by life almost day by day, moment by moment. Is that the kind of maybe even course you could come on at the sanctuary. Is that the idea? Yeah, I, th I think that's the idea. That's the way I'll put it, because I don't know everything. I don't know all of God's plans, but I know I will be, you know, helping people to see, to connect to nature. There'll be so much going on. And of course, there would be other teachers there as well, because I couldn't do it all myself. But... You know, when, when we start to really open up more, the one thing I've been sharing with the world, and that is, you know, the children cross the river without a bridge. You know, you don't need a bridge. You don't need, you know, the, the kind of material things, all of them that we have today. They're, they're not needed. It's like, you know, there is so much more to learn and to understand and to connect with, that in one sense, we think that we have learned everything on something that is only, what would you say, physical, like my glass of water, something you can touch. But yet, I can look at that glass of water and that glass, and I see things that a scientist might say, but you couldn't see that with your human eyes. So I see, see it with my the eyes of my soul, but through my human eyes as well, in that, in that way. So the sanctuary is about, in a sense, us moving forward spiritually um, and, 
and having no boundaries. So everyone is welcome of all faiths and none. Even if you say you believe in nothing, you're still welcome. What you remind, what you say there reminds me of a comment William Blake made, which is that there's something really true about our desire for growth, for more. But what we get wrong is that we think it's more material possessions, more material growth and not spiritual. And that he felt two or three hundred years ago that it was going to be crucial for us to learn about spiritual growth and wanting it all in the spiritual sense, not the material sense. He is correct. It's not about the material things at all. Like it is about spiritual growth. It's about that intertwining. And um, just to see the children crawl. I have seen so much of the incredible futures we have um, of us growing spiritually. And I know there's some negatives there, but I know we can, we can make that journey. I know we can do it. Um, and it's not just children crossing the water. There, there's billions of, like, if you could see what I could see today, you would know you don't need all the material things. Eventually, we won't need our internet. Our so, phones. We won't need any of that. And I smile at that. That is absolutely incredible. Just ask yourself, how do those children cross the water without a bridge? They're not, their feet are not touching the water. Just, just explain for us that image there. Um, for people that haven't heard it? Um, I was just shown um, one part of it was children playing and they were doing things spiritually that was incredible. You know, the, the life of all of the plants were responding to the children in a sense like, like playing with them as well. And then suddenly one of the children went towards the river and the others followed and they crossed the river without the bridge. No feet touching. It was like they just ran across. Literally just, they were just laughing, just having fun. This was normal. This was natural. Um, and I know that has to do with the intertwining of, of us realizing that life is not all about material things you have to remember spiritually you cannot take any material thing with you at all you know none and, but, and we, we forget that yeah so this is this is a a vision of you might say the evolution or the development of human consciousness as a whole even in what seem like quite dark times often for us now and to add that this is a vision shared by both Dante and Blake in their own way. For Dante, it's a vision of the earthly Eden, which is creation not just restored, but creation made in its fullest potential. And so the whole of nature, plant, human and animal, knows of its being in the divine wind, that's the divine spirit. And Blake too concludes his poem, Jerusalem, by saying, all human forms identified, even tree, metal, earth and stone, all human forms identified living, going forth and returning wearied into the planetary lives of years, months, days and hours, reposing and then awakening into his bosom in the life of immortality. And I, I think we have to try and allow ourselves to see those incredible futures you know, of those children, you know, and, and there's loads, there's loads more. It's, um, how would I say it? It's, it was fascinating just to watch the, the grass and the plants and everything around the children responding to them and the connection of life. And of course, the light, the light was, um, I can't explain the light so many times. I can't because there's so many different levels of light in that in that way. Um, so yes, we, we just have to allow ourselves to think of 
what we might think is impossible is possible. At the end of the Divine Comedy, Dante almost says, look, I'm out of ways of trying to describe this light. You're going to have to go with it yourself now. I don't know what else to say. Over to you. And it's a bit like when you're talking then. Yeah, there, it's, it's extremely hard to, to, to describe the light. Extremely hard. Allow yourself to awaken. Become conscious of your soul and, and know that you, you aren't alone. You have a guardian angel. And if, if I can see all that I can see, I see no reason why you can't. And to remember that it's not all about, you know, the material things. Allow yourself to connect to nature, but especially to connect to your soul. Allow yourself to see that light 